Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today we'll be talking remotely once again with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices orthopedic surgery in Ashtabula, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today, Bill. Thank you for having me, Randy. Well, Dr. Seeds, what I, what I thought we would discuss today is, is your approach to a very common problem, and that's the patient that presents to your office with shoulder pain. And I think this is one of the most common reasons for a patient to actually uh, go see an orthopedic surgeon because shoulder pain is, is extremely common. And as we age, we're going to develop, uh, most of us are going to develop problems with shoulder pain at some point in our lives. So what I thought we would do today is, is go through how an orthopedic surgeon such as yourself approaches a patient who comes into the office with shoulder pain. And first, what I would like to do is understand a little bit about what you're looking for. What types of disease processes might bring a patient into your office for shoulder pain? Second, I would like to understand a little bit about how you go through the process of making that diagnosis and defining what's causing the patient's shoulder pain and how you're going to move on to treatment. And finally, what I would like to discuss is, is ways in which a patient may be able to provide you with the information necessary to help you make a diagnosis and help with uh, treatment in that, in that patient's uh, shoulder pain problem. So anyway, begin by talking a little bit about how you as an orthopedic surgeon view a patient who presents with shoulder pain. What sort of diagnoses and, and what sort of conditions are you worried about when that patient shows up in your office? Well, Randy, most of uh, the shoulder problems that we see are going to be focused around rotator cuff injuries, uh, possibly labral injuries, as we refer to as slap injuries, uh, impingement problems that people may refer to as bursitis of the shoulder, um, AC joint problems, the acromioclavicular joint uh, can also give uh, problems to the shoulder consistent with an arthritic process or an impingement process in the shoulder. Instability problems we look for that have to do with the, the dynamics of the shoulder. We'll also look at, we'll be concerned about scapular problems that, that are associated with the shoulder and how the scapula moves in relation to the shoulder. We'll also be looking at outliers such as neck pain that can sometimes produce some of the shoulder pain that we may see. Um, and as, a, as an aside, uh, we even may go one further step with, depending on the age of the patient, um, sometimes even, even orthopedists, we will pick up uh, people with uh, some silent heart disease or something that can show up as shoulder pain, where uh, in part of the workup, we, we may uh, follow up with EKG and other things like that to to verify that there may be something else going on, such as a, a heart problem. So we have to kind of keep a, a, a wide range of, uh, of thoughts, you know, when we see this patient. And uh, I think the first thing we do is when the patients come in the office is we're, we're really under that observation mode. We're, we're looking at how that patient is entering the office. Are they, are they listing? Are they holding the shoulder? Are they using that shoulder? Are they protracted with the shoulder? Is their neck angulated one way or the other? It, are, how, what's their posturing? And you know, all of those things are signals right off the bat that can start sending um, the picture uh, to the orthopedist to start to get an idea of maybe what, what they're gonna be working against. Well, I think that's a, that's a, a broad range and I think you've done a, a very good job of sort of uh, setting the, the, the discussion topic for today. And, and that is that shoulder pain, you know, patients present, they just know their shoulder hurts. They, they've heard all sorts of things. They've heard about bursitis. They may have heard about uh, uh, dislocated shoulder. They may have heard about rotator cuff tears, but they always come with some sort of a preconceived notion of, of what's going on with their shoulder. And I think what you've pointed out is that you know, the shoulder can hurt for lots of different reasons. And it's our job as orthopedists to really zero in and try to find out what is exactly causing the pain. What condition is causing the pain? What type of an injury may have led to the problem? Um, or what sort of other medical conditions may be giving you the pain which is actually being perceived in the shoulder? And you, would I, you and I would call that referred pain. 
for example, the left shoulder and left arm hurting from a heart attack, or sometimes even gallbladder disease can give you right shoulder pain. So it's not always in the shoulder, and I think, I think that's, that's a, a very important point to point out to, to patients who are starting to experience these symptoms and not really understanding what's going on uh, with their body sometimes. Um, you know, one of the things I think we ought to distinguish for patients, I think a lot of patients tend to think that when something starts hurting in terms of musculoskeletal system, their orthopedic complaints, it's got to be that way for some type of an injury. And a lot of patients tend to come in and, and may have had a trivial injury that they, they sort of suggest or at least they think that maybe that injury uh, actually led to the problems and the symptoms that they're experiencing. But I think you and I as orthopedists understand that a lot of the conditions we see, especially in the shoulder, are, are degenerative conditions, conditions that really aren't related to an injury, even a re, an injury in the remote past. They're just problems that have come about through wear and tear over a period of time from what we would term as a degenerative process. Can you, can you give us a little bit of insight about how a patient should go about trying to interpret you know, their history, their history of injury, something that may have occurred to their shoulder versus shoulder pain that's just arisen and how you, how you as an orthopedic surgeon try to distinguish those two things. Sure, Randy. I, I, uh, I think you've, you've brought up some good points in, in how, how we do look at the shoulder and how sometimes these presentations are, are something that may, may have been in the shoulder for a period of time and just because maybe something has just happened they may relate that specific uh that, that specific event to that shoulder be becoming problematic and and uh, i would say that that we certainly see a, a a population of patients that do present just like that where they've had some degenerative or degenerative type of problems over the over many years that we know take a long time to develop and just recently they had some event that that brought them to the office and they're convinced that that's probably what did it, but but in, in actuality, they've had a problem for a long time. Um, so, and I, and I would say that those people are are just getting by. You know, they're 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 able to function. The mechanics are working well enough that they can function, and things are okay. And then it just takes that one, if you want to call it a tipping point, where where a little event may set everything off into action, and 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 that's how we end up seeing some of these people. So. Uh, in, in going back to um, uh, to discussing what you know how, how these people present with symptoms and how they relate to their problems, um, you know the most important thing is to find out exactly why they presented. And you know a lot of times people will tell you they've been sleeping on their shoulder wrong, or they woke up one morning and they 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 started having shoulder pain, or they. Uh, they may have fallen asleep in their car or fallen asleep, uh, you know, studying, laying on a desk or certain activities that sometimes we have a little bit of difficulty figuring out, okay, well, how did that, how did that event really lead to the shoulder pain or, or has there been more going on over time? So, so certainly, you know, the, the traumatic type of injuries where there's been a, an impaction type of injury, a traction, distraction type of injury from a, you know, a high speed, uh, like a skiing accident or water skiing, um, things like this where there's some kind of impact or distraction. You know, those are things that we can more easily relate to specifically uh, as, a, as a trauma to the shoulder. Yeah. Um, so, so we're looking in that kind of a, uh, a mindset as, as to is, it, is there something traumatic versus do we believe there maybe, yeah, they, you know, they, they might have done some extra work that day, but we really can't discern something that's specific that, that really set that problem off. Does that kind of go along with what you're thinking? Yeah, it does. And I think that, that it clarifies uh, several things. What I'd be interested in is, is really looking at some of the specific things in the history that you want to get at with the patient. When you begin questioning the patient about the nature of their pain and I guess how it's affecting their day-to-day -day life and the types of symptoms they're having, what's important to you? What are the key questions you're going to ask that patient? Well, certainly the, the, pain, the pain factor is, is the starting point is 
as to how does this relate to their daily activities. Is this something that is it bothering them more at night? Is it something that bothers them after an activity? Does it bother them during the use of the shoulder? Those are important aspects to figure out if it's if that pain is involved in the activity of the shoulder or is it something later after that activity or is it as I said is it night pain is it pain in the morning when they wake up is it more of a stiffness and what kind of pain is that is it a sharp pain is it a throbbing pain is it a catching type of pain um, is it a is it a pain that radiates down the extremity or down through the back of the shoulder or up to the neck all of those things can help us isolate the what we may feel is the etiology of that pain or, or help get a better picture for where the questions may continue to go to, to isolate that process. Now, a couple of things that, that, that we need to clarify, and that is when you talk about radiating pain, can you define that a little bit better? What, what are we talking about and what, what is going on in your mind as an orthopedic surgeon when you see pain that radiates away from the shoulder? Well, I, I, would, I would relate that to specifically, uh, I'm looking at, at two different processes, um, possibly a third, as to how they describe where the pain may start and where it ends up. Now, it may be perceived as I see it as radiating pain, but the patient doesn't. For instance, they may be complaining of shoulder pain, but they complain down lower below their shoulder. But I'm, I'm looking at it as radiating from possibly a rotator cuff problem where I typically see descriptions of pain that are below the shoulder. They're not actually in the shoulder joint, but they're referred down to where the deltoid muscles and so forth may be working harder to function for the shoulder and, and possibly involved in that pain symptom syndrome or the fact that the rotator cuff is referring pain to an area that may be not specifically over the top of the shoulder. So I'm looking at that as referred pain. The patient is referring to it, that's where my pain is. Then we can look as, as, as to radiating pain where the patient may say, the pain starts here, doctor, and then it goes down my arm. They can feel it going down their arm. And, and that's where we start looking more at possibly uh, impingement type of syndromes within the neck where there may be nerve involvement. Or I, I, have, seen, I have seen shoulder problems where there is radiation down the, perceived radiation down the arm where it, it's a combined tear and instability problem. So, uh, and, and that has to do more with inflammation of the shoulder and how close the brachial plexus, the nerves are to the shoulder. So, so there can be a lot of these things working together and it's just important to, like, like you said, to, to figure out what that process is and, and, and where it's, how it's contributing to the problem. Now you also mentioned that patients will sometimes complain of a catching sensation or a shifting in the shoulder. Can you, can you discuss that in a little bit more detail and, and tell me what you're looking for when, when the patient begins to complain of a catching sensation? What are we talking about? Well, it, it, I think we all see, see patients that, that will come in and describe, uh, that can describe that possibility of where they feel a, a catching sensation with the way they move their shoulder. or. Um, some of them may refer to it as a snapping process or a locking process. And I think it is important for us to figure out, you know, is there pain associated with that snapping? Um, I tend, if there is not pain associated with it, I, 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 I still continue to try to, to work through following up that, that part of the exam, but I don't pay as much attention to it if there isn't pain associated with it or if there isn't a true instability process with it. So I, I think you've got to be able to, to you know, get through that verbiage of what the patient's using to describe, hey doc, I've got this clunking sound or clicking sound, because those are the things where we may look at, say, the biceps tendon and how the biceps is working within the groove, where the biceps can flip in and out of that groove sometimes to create that snapping, or, or sometimes a, a thickened bursa in the shoulder or uh, can cause some of that snapping. Uh, it, it just depends on you know how how we look at that and what they've described with, is associated with that and the use of the shoulder when that when they're describing that clunking catching or audible pop of the shoulder um, 
and sometimes that that popping mechanism may be related to instability so you've got to be able to correlate those things and I think it's really important to to be able to hone in on their verbiage that they are using and make sure that though what they're saying is what you're thinking now let's move on and talk some about when you begin to examine the patient what are the key physical findings that you're looking for in a patient to try to help you make a diagnosis of what's causing their shoulder pain? Well, you know, what I usually start with is I'll start with the inspection, um, observation and inspection. I'll already be looking at how that patient might have walked into the office, walked into the, the room or how they're sitting and, and observe if, you know, if they're listing, like I said, or they're they're holding the shoulder you know what are they doing right there with my interaction as to how how that they're reacting to the the pain in their shoulder let's say for that exam um, I'm gonna look at specific things if if for instance it's a female I'm gonna look at how her bra strap is she wearing a bra strap is it over her shoulder is it is that bra strap painful is did she come in with a purse on that side of her shoulder um, those are little helpful hints that can help me right away to tell you know if if there's any involvement in say the uh, acromioclavicular joint things like that 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 can be sensitive to uh, problems with with bras and etc um, but keeping all those things in mind so we're, we're talking about observation I'm going to be looking at also the uh, the mechanics of the scapula that that work with that and the neck so my next step will be the inspection of the shoulder and specific things I'm looking for. I'm going to look at what we call the, basically as I've observed the joint, am I looking for swelling? Do I see any redness? Do I see any um, black and blue, what we may call ecchymosis, you know, that could be related to trauma? Uh, so I, I look for that type of aspect. Is there any abnormality of this shoulder versus the other shoulder? Do I see something obvious right off the bat? Dr. Sees, I, I suspect that, that, like me, you're very interested in the range of motion and evaluating the range of motion on the shoulder. You know, the, the shoulder has such a, 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 a very large range of motion for, for probably the greatest range of motion of any joint in the body. And, and we can tell so many things from looking at the range and how pain occurs during certain phases of movement, certain areas of the range of motion. How do you go about assessing that in a patient in your office? Yes, I, I think that range of motion definitely is one of the, the first indicators that we can use in our exam to start to tip us off to the, the pain type of symptom, symptoms or syndromes that may be occurring in the shoulder. Um, I, I typically will, will be looking at the passive range of motion, um, basically looking at you know where where is the pain related to that motion when I'm doing the the passive type of movement for that patient where they're not actively doing it but I'm moving their shoulder for instance if I do something to move the shoulder into a little bit of external rotation let's say where I keep the arm in and I move the arm out the the hand out am I getting any limitations and is there pain with those limitations then I start thinking more of a you know, a contracture type of problem, more of an adhesive capsulitis thing where we're losing rotation. If they have good passive motion and there's pain at the end range, let's say, of elevation, I may be looking more at an impingement type of problem in the shoulder. Um, is there pain with active motion? You know, when the patient's actively trying to, to lift their shoulder or lift against resistance so that they're using muscle now with that range of motion is there an association with say a rotator cuff tear or a labral problem so so yes the motion and where that motion is related to the pain is critical to trying to figure out what's going on uh, with that patient's shoulder now nearly every part of the body we as orthopedists have special tests that we use to try to determine you know maybe something specific uh, there are some tests that we do that, that if the test is positive, and when I'm talking about a test, I'm talking about something we ask the patient to do or we put the, the joint through a range of motion and we're looking for very specific things. Um, are there any specific tests that you do in the shoulder that you feel are very, very uh, beneficial to you in terms of making a very accurate diagnosis? Yes, I feel there are, there are a couple of of. Uh, a couple of things on exam that may may help me make a more accurate diagnosis. 
Uh, number one is is does is just perceived weakness. You know, is does the patient have true muscle weakness with with lifting the shoulder, and and where is that weakness? Does it start off with with elevation from a a lower aspect versus a higher aspect of where the shoulder is. Um, is that, that helps me determine right off the bat if there's the possibility of a rotator cuff injury. And certain exams that we can do, you know, when the, if you keep the arm, say, in the scapular plane at about 30 degrees, where we might have them try to push against resistance, you know, where, they're, where we're trying to isolate that supraspinatus tendon part of the rotator cuff, where we see more rotator cuff tears, is, is that an area where we have perceived weakness? Um, I, may, I may then go to an exam of, of trying to look at the, what, we descri what I described as impingement. You know, do I get an end range um, when I try to keep the scapula in place and I lift that shoulder up? Am I able to impinge the shoulder and specifically repeat that pain? And where does the patient feel that pain in the shoulder? Um, there are certain exams of uh, apprehension type of tests, things I can do in looking at stability of a shoulder, where I can do the, with the patient lying down, sometimes with the patient sitting up, I can do things to rotate the shoulder and, and try to shift that joint to see if I can recreate any of those instability uh, symptoms the patient may be describing. Um, I do think that uh, what I talked about before about range of motion, uh, passively, if, if there's a loss of, of essentially internal rotation right away, that, that really does tip me off to a contracture type of problem. Um, I'll look for crossover type of things where I may be compressing the AC joint um, versus, let's say they have no pain over the AC joint, but they have pain with as I bring the arm over and compressing, I'm, I'm trying to look at the labrum inside the shoulder, uh, certain tests that I'm doing to look at that type of problem as far as a tear. Um, and then I'll try to also isolate certain activities with the shoulder that relate to the biceps tendon that I think we have some very good tests that can help us um, figure that process out right away also with just working with resistance and working in uh, different levels of where the shoulder uh, could be on that exam. So I think there are some very good specific tests that we do that, that really do help us in isolating the, uh, the problem. You know, I think we ought to point out to patients when we do these tests, what we're really trying to do is put the shoulder in some sort of a position or, or have the, the shoulder work in such a way is that it isolates one specific part of the anatomy. And if that causes pain or causes uh, a sensation that the patient is complaining about, we feel that we further isolated the part of the anatomy or the part of the shoulder that's actually causing the problem. So these tests are, are very useful from that aspect. But I think all of us are going to, at some point, even during that first visit with the patient, begin to think about what type of imaging we're going to do with the shoulder. Because I don't think many patients are going to get out of the orthopedist office with a, sh with a shoulder problem and not have some type of imaging done, whether it's plain x-rays or whether it's some type of CAT scan or MRI scan. How do you approach imaging of the shoulder? When do you talk with the patient about uh, either x-rays or moving on to, to more advanced imaging? Well, with, with my patients, with anybody complaining of any shoulder pain, they're always going to have an x-ray that's going to be done before my exam. I'm going to have that x-ray present when I do my exam because I, I believe that all of, all of your shoulder exams, and, and basically I do the same thing with the knee and ankle um, and any joint I'm examining, I have an x-ray that I can correlate directly with my exam so I can specifically look at the relationship of, let's say, the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the shoulder itself, the glenohumeral joint, and I'll look at that to see if I see any early signs of arthritis that could involve the shoulder itself or the AC joint or calcifications that can be present in the rotator cuff or uh, other mechanics of that shoulder that, that may be, I may be able to see a sloping acromion uh, which could be impinging on the shoulder itself on the rotator cuff. So I'll look for those things right off the bat and try to correlate that to my exam. Um, as far as progressing on to other studies, again, it depends on the presentation and the history that 
that the uh, the patient may uh, have given that needs further evaluation. For instance, if I if I have a high suspicion that there is a rotator cuff injury, or that there let's say the patient is very limited with with their activity level, the pain level's high, and I'm suspecting some type of injury like a rotator cuff or labral injury, uh, I will go right to uh, an MRI evaluation immediately to help me and assist me in giving me more information before I start any type of therapy program or uh, you know advise on on any other intervention or discuss uh, you know the next process that may be involved with uh, anything from uh, injection to surgery so yeah I do use all of these tests and they're very valuable in in going through the exam. Now you mentioned injections and I think most folks most patients would think of an injection as something that is done primarily to treat the problem. But I think you and I as orthopedists use differential injections or use what we would consider a therapeutic trial of an injection to try to get at, again, what's causing the pain. How do you use injections in your practice when you're trying to evaluate a patient's shoulder pain? Uh, when would you, you begin to discuss this with a patient? Yes, I, I do believe injections can be very valuable in, in helping differentiate some of the pain uh, complaints. And, and again, uh, it just depends on how that patient presents and what I'm trying to, to figure out as, as far as where the etiology of that pain, where is the origin of it? Does it have, a, is it specifically related to the AC joint itself? Is it related to impingement or subacromial symptoms? or is it intra-articular within the joint itself of the shoulder? So sometimes I may discuss with the patient that I'd like to inject their shoulder as a diagnostic injection to help me see if I can isolate where that pain may be because, because some people can, can have uh, symptoms you know, related to the AC joint and have no real impingement but just pure joint pain. Other people can have, have symptoms that let, let's say they have a labral injury that's inside the shoulder itself and um, but they're also giving you symptoms of impingement which sometimes they are combined uh, but you might want to diagnostically be able to figure out well is it inside the shoulder or is it subacromial so you'll do a subacromial injection and and you may get relief immediately and know okay that's my problem it isn't inside the shoulder it's it's above the shoulder so so those things can be can be very valuable for you and, and sometimes therapeutic. Um, you know, depending on the on the exam and, and, and your confidence level with the the, the uh, integrity of the soft tissue and rotator cuff, um, sometimes you can you can go ahead and use that also as as a treatment plan as long as uh, you feel comfortable that the uh, the soft tissue as far as the rotator cuff and other structures are in. Uh, in good working order and intact, and you're just purely dealing with some inflammatory process. You know, I think we ought to point out to patients that when we do these injections, we, we normally inject two different types of medications. One is, is we, and, and they're usually mixed together, so we'll mix a little bit of, a, of an anesthetic, such as Novocaine, Lidocaine, or Bupivacaine. We'll mix that with a little bit of cortisone, and what gives you that immediate pain relief is the, is the Novocaine or the Lidocaine that's used. And we use that, if, if, for example, you mentioned the AC joint. When we're trying to decide whether the pain is coming from the AC joint or um, the uh, subacromial bursa, we may just simply put Novocaine, maybe with a little bit of cortisone, right into the AC joint. Now we know that that medication stays within the AC joint. It numbs up everything around the AC joint in the capsule and the bone ends that, that may be causing the pain. And if 100% of the pain goes away, then we tend to interpret that as all the pain is coming from the AC joint. And conversely, like you said, we can put it in different places and try to say, okay, all of the pain is either coming from the subacromial bursa, there's no pain relief when I inject into the joint, there may be no pain relief when I inject into the AC joint, but when I inject into the subacromial bursa and wait for a moment, all of a sudden all the pain's gone, we know that the, the problem is most likely originating in that compartment of the joint. And I think the therapeutic part of the injection comes from that addition of the cortisone. The cortisone is a very potent anti-inflammatory medication and over a period of several days, 
it begins to reduce the inflammation, reduce the, the pain in the shoulder joint, and that may last for several weeks. Sometimes it may be enough to knock the problem out and, and the, the problem not return uh, on an indefinite basis. But, uh, but I think patients are sometimes confused by, by what medications we're using and what those medications are doing and, and what type of information we're getting and then all of them are interested in how is this going to help me resolve my problem? How is this going to actually be therapeutic? So I think that's useful information for patients that I always try to explain when we go through these, these injections as part of our diagnosis. Do you have any other observations uh, on, on what I've just said? No, I, I agree completely with that. I, I think it's just important that we, we explain why we're using it and, and what we're trying to, you know, what's the end result we're trying to obtain from from the use of the injection in helping us, you know, figure out what the problem is. You know, I think, I think this has been an excellent discussion about how we as orthopedists approach a patient who comes in with shoulder pain. And I think that you and I both are at, at this point in time, after we've gone through the history, we've understood what the patient is complaining about, we've gone through an exam to where we have a pretty good feel for, for how that shoulder is functioning. And then we've looked at some x-rays and perhaps we've done some imaging studies that are more advanced than plain x-rays. We may have done an MRI scan, which is by far the most common test that, that you and I are going to use today to try to delineate what's going on with the shoulder. I think we probably ought to, to cover one other aspect of, of, of more advanced uh, uh, imaging, and that's the use of, of an MRI scan arthrogram or a shoulder arthrogram. Do, do you find that the addition of actually adding dye to the shoulder still is of benefit in terms of trying to get a, a more definitive diagnosis? Do you use that commonly? I can tell you that, yes, I, I, I used to use um, uh, the, the dye uh, intraarticular injections combined with the MR, and I have found that, you know, it was, it really was an inconsistent test for me as far as who was reading the test, um, how you know, did it did it show some of the labral tears? Yes, it did. Um, were my exams getting better in combination with with the MRIs, where I was able to feel that I was able to pick it up, even though the MRI did may not have shown it? I believe that's true. Also, um, I have gotten away from doing the injections, the arthrograms with with MRI. I felt that um, it, at least for me, uh, I get enough information from the MRI, and I feel that it's. Uh, it's it's enough at this point for me, and along with my exam, to you know to to figure out what our next steps are going to be. You know, and I think in a lot of these patients, the next step may be doing an arthroscopy or doing what we would consider a diagnostic arthroscopy. How often do you find yourself moving towards arthroscopy today, with all the imaging techniques that we have and the the I would say pretty refined sense of of diagnostic skills that orthopedists have to try to try to really define the problem before they consider some sort of an invasive um, surgical procedure. How often do you find that you suggest to a patient, you know, I'm not quite certain what's going on with your shoulder. This is what I think is going on and we're going to actually put a TV camera in your shoulder and have a look around. Uh, th that's a good question, Randy. I, I feel that my I feel my exam skills have gotten uh, are pretty high high tuned to in combination with my with my X-ray and my MRI, where I, I pretty much feel that I have a good understanding of of what my what they're presenting symptom is and what I'm going to treat. Um, I would say I we I do occasionally do what is what you're referring to as a diagnostic arthroscopy. Uh, where I may not be sure why those that patient is having impingement symptoms, um, you know, is there a labral pathology that I'm not I'm not picking up on exam? Um, there are there are times that, uh, especially with work injuries, that I'm required to do a diagnostic arthroscopy before I can even treat the patient. Um, but I, I would tell you that I feel very comfortable with my exam, and that most of the time I'll give that patient. What I'll tell them is, look, this is my plan. This is what we're going to start with in taking care of. Because a lot of patients do show, you know, they'll show those impingement symptoms. So you're, you're initially going to be treating that impingement when you go in the shoulder. You're going to be doing a decompression. You're going to be looking at 
the shoulder and the labrum and so forth while you're there. So I let patients know of the possibilities that, hey, even though I'm treating this impingement, there may be something that the scan hasn't picked up and my exam has not, has not shown me where I may need to take one more step and go ahead and treat that labrum or, or there may be some partial tearing of the biceps in the shoulder that I didn't expect. But what I like to assure them of is that, that, that everything will be completed at the time of my treatment, uh, but it really, it, it's really more informing them of those possibilities, I think, that you may be referring to as diagnostic exam. Maybe I've gotten away from saying, hey, this is gonna be a diagnostic exam where I'm actually, I am treating the impingement. We are going forward with this process and there may be more associated with it. So if I understand you correctly, what, what you're saying is that you very rarely do a pure diagnostic arthroscopy of the shoulder anymore. You have a pretty good idea that when, when you suggest arthroscopy to a, to a patient, you're going in not only to have a look around to confirm the diagnosis, but you're going to, to move towards fixing the problem at that time. And you're pretty certain at that point what you're going to be doing in the shoulder and pretty certain what you're going to find. Is, is that accurate? Yes, I would say that's, I, I would say absolutely. Well, I think that's good information. I do think that that's, that's been somewhat of a, of a shift, you know, and a lot, a lot of, of it had to do with the MRI scan. Uh, MRI scan has given us far more information than, than we had 30 years ago in terms of shoulder anatomy or any joint anatomy. And it's allowed us to really refine our diagnosis to the point that we don't necessarily have to look in the shoulder to see what's going on. 30 years ago, well, let's say 20 years ago, it was not uncommon to, to actually use the arth arthroscope to actually get into the shoulder without making big incisions so that we could actually make a diagnosis and see what was going on. And clearly we could fix the problem at that point in time, but it was not uncommon to have, have a patient be told, we're just gonna go take a look around. We're not gonna fix anything. We're gonna stop, we're gonna come back, we're gonna talk to you about what we find, and then we're going to go back and do whatever surgery is necessary. And that, that may have been an, uh, you know, an open procedure. It may not have been an arthroscopic procedure and may have required a bigger incision. So that's been a huge change uh, over the last, I would say, 15 years to, to 20 years. As we close this discussion, which I think has been an excellent discussion in terms of, of preparing patients for what, they're, th what they should expect when they go see an orthopedist. They've been referred to an orthopedist for shoulder pain. They really don't know what to expect. This has been an excellent discussion to prepare them for what's going to happen in the office and perhaps what's going to happen to them over the next several weeks as you and I as orthopedists try to define what's going on with the shoulder, try to treat that problem and try to decide how we're going to get them in the best functional, uh, functional state that we can. Is there anything that you would suggest that patients need to do in terms of helping us as orthopedists get to the bottom of our shoulder problem? What are some key things, either questions patients should ask or information they should be prepared to give their surgeon on that first visit that may help that surgeon really get to the bottom of their problem? Well, I, I think we've, we've summarized basically everything that we go through and, and what we're looking for as far as uh, trying to come up with a complete diagnosis of, of what's going on with that shoulder. I, I think the best thing the patients can do is really take those surveys or things that we do initially or the nurses may do to, to you know, hone in on the, the type of pain that they're having. Is it sharp? Is it throbbing? When is that pain? Is it related to, you know, what activities? Um, those things are very important because they do all make a difference in, in how we look at it. And, and being able to be specific about where the pain is and when it started for them. I mean, all, all of those issues are, are very important. And I think, I, I think that sometimes that, you know, that, that the patients don't understand that we listen, those, those, those verbal cues are very significant and important when we're going through that, that history with the patient. And, and uh, you know, sometimes as well, you, as, you know as well as I do as, and our peers that sometimes we can, when a patient gives us a real accurate and, and a good history, uh, we can sometimes, you know, we may have 90% of the picture right there before we even examine the patient. So. For the shoulder, I would say a lot of those issues are, are very important and, and also making sure that, they, that we're just as interested in, in their other you know, comorbidities, other problems. Are they diabetic? You know, are, do they have other uh, systemic problems, 
things things like that that may play into um, into this these shoulder issues. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. You know, I, I do think that that we're always told as medical students that 85 percent of the diagnosis comes from the history, and the other 15 percent, you know, comes from just confirming what our initial um, sort of uh, decisions are made on patterns and. It's very important the first information that you give the orthopedic surgeon is as complete as possible because, because we as orthopedic surgeons tend to sort of uh, decide what's a possibility and how we're going to approach that problem right off the bat. And that information that we get right up front is very important. And it, and it may seem like a, you know, just one more piece of paperwork to fill out if you come to the office and the, and the surgeon who, who is working there is asking you questions that you just don't want to take the time to fill out, but it's so important. It's so important to be accurate and think about that beforehand so that the surgeon goes in the right direction from, from the start. So thank you very much for explaining that. And thanks again for, for joining us today. Is there any last minute comments you'd like to make uh, on today's topic um, as we close? Yeah, yes, Randy. One, one last comment I'd like to say that, that what you just brought up is I think real important is I always get a, a, a couple of patients, and it, it could be a couple of patients, every office day will say, boy, doc, I, I didn't know you actually read all that stuff I wrote down. I thought it was just you know nebulous paperwork. I didn't really think people looked at it. So I, I really think that's great that we've, we've impressed upon, you know, they're just helping us hone in on these things, and we look at everything. I mean, all of that, all that information they're putting on paper, we're looking at it. Yeah, I agree. I think people think that some, sometimes we just get the MRI scan and there's the diagnosis, but it's not that, it's not, it's not that simple at all. It's very important what patients tell us. So, so thanks for, uh, for validating that. And thanks again for uh, joining us today. Look forward to further discussions in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you.